You know, I don't usually do this, but I'm going to ask you to stand today for the reading of the gospel. And I'll be reading from the gospel according to Luke, beginning in the 19th chapter, reading the 41st through the 44th verses. And hear God's word. As he came near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, if you... Even you had only recognized on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. Indeed, the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up ramparts around you and surround you and hem you in on every side. They will crush you to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave within you one stone upon another. Because you did not recognize the time of your visitation from God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. I want to begin this morning by asking us to consider the personage of Jesus. According to the gospel writers, our Lord shared fully in the conditions of human life. Jesus was born just like us. The Bible says that Jesus got hungry just like us. The scripture tells us that Jesus got thirsty just like us. Paul, writing to the Hebrews, offers this message, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every way has been tempted just as we are. Jesus knew the sorrows and everything that comes from being in a family and having friends just like us. When his friend Lazarus died, the scripture says that Jesus wept. Moreover, just as you and I will die, Jesus died. But praise God, he didn't stay dead and neither will we. The mystery that we deal with as Christians is that Jesus was fully human and fully divine. Not 50% human and 50% divine, but fully human and fully divine. However, when we consider that Jesus experienced the full spectrum of human emotions, it's not strange to it that just as we long for peace, Jesus also longed for peace. Dr. Luke tells us that as Jesus approached the city of Jerusalem on a journey that ended at Calvary, he wept over Jerusalem. He cried out to her, if you only you had recognized this day the things that, that make for peace. Certainly we can relate to a longing for peace. We find no difficulty today in joining Jesus in his cry for peace. The unsettling events of the past few months have only heightened our well awareness of the turmoil that is prevalent in the world today in which we live. These events have sent us on a quest to find answers, to make some sense of what's happening. A quest to find something that will allow us to have some sense of peace. The picture that came to my mind as I reflected on this passage of scripture is that just as Jesus wept over Jerusalem, as he sits at the right hand of the Father today, that Jesus is weeping Weeping over what's going on in the Middle East. Weeping over what's going on in China. Weeping over what's going on in Seattle, in Portland, Chicago, 
Minneapolis, and many other cities in our country, weeping over what's happening in Atlanta, weeping over the looting and destruction, weeping over the senseless killing of so many of his children. Every time one of God's children dies of an overdose, Jesus weeps. Every time one of God's children kills another one of God's children, black or white, another tear falls from Jesus' eye. I want you to get the picture. In that land where there is no sin, in that land where there is no death, in that land where there is no illness, in that land where Jesus promises to wipe the tear from every eye. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, weeping over Jerusalem, weeping over the world, weeping over what's going on in Atlanta, Georgia today. And moreover, as long as there is no peace on earth, the tears of Jesus will keep falling. And while Jesus is weeping in heaven everywhere on earth, people are longing for peace, longing for an end to the bloodshed on the battlefields of the world, longing for an end to the bloodshed and violence on our streets, longing for an end to the hatred and divisiveness that dominates our relationships today, longing for a world where children can grow up unafraid of being shot as they walk on the street where adults can work without stress and seniors can live out their days in tranquility, longing for a time when there are no pandemics. But none, none of these things seem to be on the horizon. So along with Jesus, we cry out, Oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, when will you know peace? And for us, Jerusalem is every city and every street. And the cry is constant and the cry is universal. Therefore, we must look at what our weeping Jesus is saying about his Jerusalem and our Atlanta, about his Jerusalem and our world. Jesus states his reason for coming. I am the gate, he says. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly, Jesus said. Life more abundantly. My reflection is that abundant life is a life that includes peace. Many of us have set out to address the problems of reconciliation and peace, reconciliation and peace that we face in our country. Indeed, the whole world. Demonstrators march. Government leaders confer. Maybe they confer. It seems like they do more fighting than conferring. Bishops write pastoral letters. However, the destruction and the chaos continue. It informs us that the problem about peace is much too big to be wrestled to the ground by plans that begin in the minds of men. This is a God-sized problem, my brothers and sisters. We are engaged in a spiritual war. Satan, Satan, Satan is the author of chaos. When he lies, the Bible says, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. God stands in opposition to the chaos. You see in the message, it says it this way, God doesn't stir us up into confusion. He brings us into peace. This goes for all churches, no exceptions. 
You see, this God-sized problem is one that only the church through the power of the Holy Spirit can heal. It requires the quality of love that only our Savior can provide. If we want to have peace, the scripture is very clear. It comes through Jesus and God's Holy Spirit. God comes to us just as he came to the Jews and the Gentiles in the first century in the person of Jesus Christ. You know, I thought about this and there are no aha moments with God. God stands at the end of of what we think of as time and sees it all in one expanse. And, and I can imagine God in the beginning looking into what would be our future and what he saw was helplessness. He saw his children wounded and, and maimed. Saw his world abused and turned into a place of chaos and desolation. In the beginning, God saw the bloodshed in the beginning, God saw the suffering and ruin, and it grieved him to his heart. Once again, in the eye of my mind, I see a picture of the creator of the universe kneeling down by that crystal river that the Bible says runs through the place called heaven. Kneeling and weeping weeping for you and weeping for me, weeping for a 2020 world in turmoil. However, let us thank God that he didn't stop there. God gathered up all of his love, gathered up all of his yearning for us to have an abundant life, all of his purpose for peace and joy and wrapped it up in his beloved son. And God said to us, here is your prince of peace. I've had it with war. No more chariots in Ephraim. No more war horses in Jerusalem. No more swords and spears, bows and arrows. He will offer peace to the nations. A peaceful rule worldwide from the four winds to the seven seas. On the Mount of Transfiguration, the words come out, this is my beloved son, listen to him. This is my beloved son, listen to him. This is the one who has the power to bring light into our darkness, to bring life where there is death, to bring peace where there is chaos. In Jesus, God visits each of us, and the question that each of us must answer is, will we contribute to the peacemaking or to the chaos? Jesus tells Jerusalem that they will experience destruction and disaster, and not one stone will be left unturned because Jerusalem did not recognize that Jesus was coming. We don't have that excuse. The scripture's clear. Oh, I like the way C.S. Lewis says it. You know, he says you can't call him a wise man or a great teacher. You have to either say he's a liar or a lunatic or you have to accept him for who he says he is, Lord and Messiah. Three times in the gospel, Jesus represents himself as peace in the gospel of John. As he comes to the disciples after the resurrection, he says, peace be with you. Jesus addresses fear by saying, peace be with you. Jesus addresses doubt by saying, peace be with you. Jesus addresses the sending by saying, peace be with you. And as the Father has sent me, I'm also sending you. Just as he said that to the disciples, he gives us that great commission to go make disciples. The Bible tells us, let us make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. The letter to the Hebrews, Paul admonishes, make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. 
James, the brother of Jesus, gives us the benefit of peacemaking. Peacemakers who so reap peace and the harvest of righteousness and our Lord himself in the Sermon on the Mount says, blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called the children of God. What this tells me is that blessings and righteousness are the fruits of peacemaking. Peacemaking, peacemaking, peacemaking. Peacemaking begins when you make a commitment to trust and obey Jesus. You and I have the ability to stop those tears in heaven by being peacemaking. Peacemaking begins when you pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Peacemaking begins when we are willing to love everyone in the same way that Christ loves us. Jesus said you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and even to the ends of the earth. Peacemaking. Peacemaking begins when we realize that we are children of the omnipotent Lord who arms us with strength and power to be witnesses to the gospel of peace, following Jesus, picking up our crosses, loving the way Christ loved, sharing the good news of Jesus. These are the things that make for peace. Let, let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with you. The words of St. Francis are particularly appropriate, I think, for these times. So let us pray. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, let us so pardon. Where there is doubt, let us so faith. Where there is despair, let us so hope. Where there is darkness, let us be light. Where there is sadness, let us bring joy. Where there is turmoil, let us be peacemakers. Lord, make us instruments of your peace. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.